Representative Martinez Fisher, thank you. Very happy to have you here. Uh, I want to start just by asking you to tell us a little bit about your path to politics. How did you get started and wind up where you are now? I'll tell you, it's, a, it's an interesting story. I graduated from the University of Texas School of Law in 1998. I went to a place in Washington, D.C. and worked for a law firm, and waited for my bar results. And as soon as those bar results came in in November of 98, I returned to San Antonio and took up a practice that was started by my uncle. Uh, and back in that time, in 1999, I think my overall monthly budget was probably about five or six hundred dollars. You know, a car payment. I think I, uh, my student loans were in forbearance, and so I had a very small budget. Uh, and when an opportunity to run for the state house came, I, you know, sort of looked internally and realized that this was the best time in my life to enter into something, and not knowing if I'm going to win or lose, but knowing that if I needed uh, to make five or six hundred dollars a month to sustain my personal obligations that I could, if I made that in one day, that I could campaign for the rest of the month. If it took me two weeks to make that money, then I could campaign for two weeks. And, and frankly speaking, I think it was the best decision timing wise. I mean, now I was 28 then, I'm 41 now, I have two children, I have responsibilities. Uh, I'm not so sure if public service would be on my top tier uh, now, you know, knowing everything that I'm responsible for. Uh, as a parent and as a husband. Uh, but it was really a unique time to say, you know what, let's just, let's just try it. I was living in my mother's house and, and I, I felt that the person representing the district, although a nice man, really didn't have those issues that were important to constituents. And, and it, all it took was a couple of Saturdays knocking on doors and asking people if they knew who their state representative was. And when they said no, I knew that I had a shot. Had you been interested in politics leading up to that? Did you, I mean, did it kind of come to you or had you been? Well, I remember some of my, my, my father died in 1993 uh, with throat cancer and he, he wasn't a smoker. Uh, but some of my fondest memories were I was like 12 years old, 13 years old, and he had run for a county commissioner in San Antonio. And we had this van, like it was a Mary Myler, you know, and I should remember my dad would drive all over Precinct 2 and we'd put signs together and and I thought that was a campaign. And then my parents owned a couple of restaurants. And so my father sat at one of the tables with a phone line he had installed uh, and opened up the phone book. And when he saw the right zip code, he called that person. And, and, and I thought that was a campaign, you know? And so I was intrigued by it. I, I, never, uh, I, I never lost that appetite for politics. And, and as I was a young college student, I had an opportunity uh, to work as an intern for Attorney General Dan Morales uh, and then I came back uh, in my law school days and worked for him again as a law clerk. And, and I certainly got a taste and exposure to Austin, the legislature. And, and when I thought public service was something I wanted to do, I realized very early on that if I had a good idea in the state of Texas as a member of the House, that my idea would impact 20 million people and now 25 million people. Uh, and that seemed to take a higher priority than other places like you know, maybe city council or school board. You felt like I could really have a positive impact in a very big way. Uh, and so I, I sort of set my sights on Austin and I, uh, I even, you know, choosing where to go to law school, I felt UT, although one of the best law schools in the country, certainly put you in place uh, to play the full contact sport of Texas politics. And, and, uh, and being in Austin certainly gave me that exposure. You're really right there on top of it when you're in school at that time in oh. Austin. I mean, I'm yeah. telling you, we saw so much. Uh, you know, I, I know Carlos Martinez is in the audience. We're classmates at UT. Uh, we had, uh, we were one of the last minority classes before Hopwood, and then you had the Hopwood decision, and there's so many things happening, you know, in those three years at, at UT that, that really, you know, told me that, you know, public service is really a noble calling, and you can really, you know, what I've learned is you can have uh, an impact and do lots of good, you can do lots of bad, or you can do nothing at all, and, and, and fortunately, you know, I, I've chosen the path that I think I want to be in this business to do a lot of good, and and we certainly have a lot, a lot of challenges where we can have some positive improvement in, in that respect. So. Well, let's talk about a couple things you've done in that, in that area. I want to start just um, to bring people up to speed. You're the chairman of the Mexican-American Legislative Caucus. Talk about what the caucus does. You know, that is probably the coolest job I've had. Uh, the Mexican-American Legislative Caucus is the oldest and it's the largest Latino caucus in the United States. It is bigger than the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, respectfully. Uh, uh, they may represent more constituents uh, by way of larger congressional districts. Uh, but we have more members. Uh, and and uh, it was founded uh, in the early 1970s, and one of its founders was a man by the name of Matt Garcia, who happens to be from San Antonio. 
Uh, and so you know, growing up in San Antonio and, and social movement politics, I mean, Matt Garcia is a household name for social change and, and civil justice. Uh, and at the time, uh, people right away try to characterize our caucus as being a democratic auxiliary group, uh, a mouthpiece for the Democratic Party. A Mexican-American Legislative Caucus was formed specifically to protect Hispanics from the Democratic Party. This was the 1970s. Uh, this is when the Democratic Party ran everything. Uh, and the handful of Hispanic members of the legislature didn't really feel like they were getting a fair shake when it came to committees and when it came to legislative priorities and, and funding priorities for certain parts of Texas. And when they formed this caucus in 1973, they had one goal and one goal only. That goal was to put one member of MAUC on the Appropriations Committee. That was their goal. That's what they set out to do. They were large enough to fit in a telephone booth. That's where they met, in a telephone booth, practically. Uh, and now we are the largest nonpartisan caucus in the legislature. And, and I have the distinct advantage of knowing that uh, with my caucus in the mid-40s, in terms of population, membership-wise, uh, when it comes to legislation, you know, your goal is to get to 76. My goal is to pick up 30 more votes. And when, it, when it's a race to the finish, you know, chasing 30 votes is a lot easier sometimes than building a coalition of 76. Uh, and so it's a great organization, uh, but I, I like people to know that we are not just a one-trick pony. And that's sort of been my personal issue that, that we, yes, we are a civil and social justice organization and we will never, you know, that is our legacy. That's who we are. But we now have members that are, you know, working for some of the biggest law firms in the country that serve on corporate boards, have their own businesses, very successful. We can walk and chew gum. We can fight voting rights and we can solve complex energy problems. We can have a say in the future of energy production in Texas. We'll have a say in the next school finance decision that comes out. Uh, we can work on complex issues. And, and so I, I, I make it my point every day to let members know uh, just how wide our reach is. And there was a time in the 2009 session where we had a member on every single standing committee in the Texas House. We had nine chairmen and women, and we had 17 chairmen and women. No other caucus had that kind of reach, and I was very proud about that. So in a, in a lot of ways, I mean, the, the way you describe that, the organization has evolved almost, you know, in parallel with the way that Latinos' roles in the political system in the state has become much more complex. And I, and I think that that's really the issue. I mean, I think when you look at when you look at this from a ten thousand foot view, I mean, it's either going to be the challenges that, that Texas will face in the next ten or fifteen years uh, will be solved uh, by policymakers uh, that either are brown or have a brown heart. That's our that's our rule. That's our litmus test. And Malk, if to be a member of Malk, you either have to be brown or you have to have a brown heart. It's not a volunteer. It's not an optional caucus. I mean. When you become a member of, of our caucus, you become a member of a family, and it's a family of ideas. And so, A, we will participate in the policy solution, and number two, our constituencies will be faced with the burden and the responsibility of having to pay for these solutions. So when it comes to public education, I think Latino families care about that more than anyone else because the kindergarten class across the entire state of Texas for the first time is majority Latino. If you look at the 10 largest school districts in our state, uh, they're either majority Hispanic or plurality Hispanic. Uh, you know, this is an issue that's not going away for, for Latinos. And if you look at, if you look at that challenge at the, at the kindergarten level, then you look at attrition rates uh, at the collegiate level and, and looking to see, you know, what the gap is for Latinos earning four-year college degrees, uh, we all know we have our work cut out for us. We have a lot of work that we need to do. And, and frankly, uh, I think the more, uh, the more brown hearts that are working on the policy solution, I think the better the outcome. Oh, I want to talk more about um, sort of the demographic issue, which is kind of underlying some of that. Kind of the most immediate manifestation of that that you've been involved with recently, though, is the redistricting fight. Yes. So give us a sense of where that is. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to ask you to tell us, it could take us all day to do the story up to this point. But where are we right now with redistricting? Well, I need to take a shot of water for that, because that is a, a at least. That's, that's, that's not easy to explain. I mean, you know, the facts are very simple. The state of Texas grew by leaps and bounds, more so than any other state in the country. 89.1% of that growth was, was minority. So that's, uh, that's 2.73 Latino, 2.73 million Latino or 3.23 million minorities. That's pretty big. As a result, we gained four seats in Congress. The last time that happened in a state like Texas, it was in the 1860s after the Civil War and the years of Reconstruction. This may not happen in my lifetime again, may not happen in my children's lifetime. And this is very significant. And the fact of the matter is, you know, legislative leaders made the decision to draw a congressional map that did not even reflect that growth. 
Now, 10 years ago, I was a freshman in the Texas House of Representatives. I barely knew where the bathrooms were at the Capitol. I mean, so let alone understanding how redistricting worked, I had no idea. Uh, legislature didn't pass a map. Legislative Redistricting Board drew a map, and next thing you know, uh, my childhood friend that I've known since the third grade, he and I were paired in a district in San Antonio. Uh, and, and if you've ever had to face your, your third grade classmate and say, well, this is not about friends, this is about business, I mean, that's a hard decision. Uh, and I knew right then and there that our caucus was financially strapped. Uh, we did not have resources uh, to fight a fight. And we actually had a split in our leadership in terms of the direction of the, uh, of the caucus itself. And by and large, we found that our districts, the districts that were most impacted uh, by the Legislative Redistricting Board were Latino districts. And so I, I think I sort of made a pinky promise with myself back then that if I wasn't gonna be around, you know, the next time this happened, we were not gonna be in that situation. Uh, and so uh, in, in, in the fall of, uh, of, of 2008, I was elected to be the chair of the caucus. Uh, right away, for every dollar that we raised, I took 50 cents and put it in a special fund uh, to make sure that we had money and resources for redistricting. When people were talking about redistricting, I was hiring lawyers. When people were hiring lawyers, I was filing lawsuits. And when people were filing lawsuits, you know, we were filing appeals. Uh, and, and we had a very proactive, aggressive position that we were not gonna let this cycle go by. Uh, and again, I, I fall back on this position that, that uh, you know, in the 1970s, uh, we found ourselves fighting democratic institutions. Uh, that also existed in redistricting. Uh, and when it came to redistricting in the 1970s and the 1980s and 1990s, uh, there were Democrats making decisions on the future of maps that often impacted the minority community. And organizations like MALDEF and LULAC were there to fight those fights. And they made it very clear, you know, over the course of history, you know, the, the, the only thing that's changed is the, is the leadership. I mean, the issue is always the same, no matter who's in charge. It seems to me the minority community always got left out. And so for the first time, I will say, uh, this redistricting was led by minority litigants, argued by minority lawyers, uh, tried in a federal court in San Antonio between, before two Hispanic judges. That's never happened in redistricting history. And the result, I think, has never happened either because you saw, at least in the state house map, you saw six legislative districts restored, uh, which is much different than what the legislature passed. Uh, that is a big victory. 10 years ago, it was three. We doubled that. Uh, of course, there was always room for improvement. Uh, there, there were other things that we could have done in the house. I'd like to if the opinion uh, or the map maybe had a couple of different twists and turns, we could be looking at even bigger gains. Uh, but in the Congress now, we have an opportunity to elect a minority in Dallas. We have the opportunity to elect a minority in Central Texas from you know, this part of Austin to San Antonio. Uh, we've been very clear that that did not always require a, a dismantling of Lloyd Doggett. In fact, we advocated for him on many occasions. But the map is what it is now. Uh, and, and now it's an opportunity. Uh, and, and, and so you know, you look at that and that's a completely different picture than what existed on the floor of the house. And so, but it took that kind of advocacy and those types of partners to, to wage that war. Uh, and it's still ongoing, but as it stands, like you said, we, we have a map and we have a primary on May 29th and we're gonna have a very hot runoff in the middle of summer. And, uh, and uh, you know, hopefully at some point we'll, we'll get to hear from presidential candidates talk about, you know, how elite we are to pursue a college education and, and uh, uh, and it'll be, uh, you know, Texas will be back in the mix and things will go back to normal and hopefully we'll have a, a final map that that's still may or may not have some changes based on what happens with the dual track litigation in Washington, D.C. So suffice it to say, it's mostly over, but I think that there's still a few rounds of boxing left to go. Yeah, okay, so talk a little bit about that. Today was, the, actually we had another development today. We right? did, we did. So if you could just sort of talk about, you know, the up to the minute state of things. Well, this morning there was a, there was a request uh, by the district court in the District of Columbia, and as you know, uh, voting rights litigation really involves two sections. Section two, which means you have the sufficiency in population to create a minority opportunity district and you fail to do so, therefore we're going to sue you to make it happen. Then you have section five that says, you know, we take a snapshot of the state of affairs, uh, what we call the benchmark, what is the, what is the current state of affairs for, for legislatures. And then we look at proposals and we compare to see if we retrogressed at all. And that's section five that takes place in DC. Uh, so that court is still litigating. Uh, we had a trial up there and we're waiting for their opinion. And in, the, in their, I guess while they're deliberating, they have asked the parties to brief, uh, you know, and they specifically asked the Latino Redistricting Task Force uh, to substantiate the assertion that uh, Anglo voters dominate uh, the primary in Congressional District 25. And, and why I think that's significant is that the voting rights protection doesn't, it's not protection for 
incumbents or political parties. It's, in, it's protection for minorities. And one of the things you have to demonstrate that there is a, there's racially polarized voting. So you have Anglos that vote one way and no matter minority, the minority community, their best efforts, despite their best efforts, they never have the opportunity to elect a candidate of their choice. And I think there's some disagreement as to whether or not polarized voting exists in Austin. Some people say Austin's Nirvana, where everybody comes together and there's no racial polarized voting and the best candidate wins. Uh, and some say that perhaps there, there are segments of racially polarized voting. And I think what the court has asked is articulate to me the argument that Anglos dominate the primary and there's nothing minorities can do in CD25 to effectuate the outcome uh, of an election. I don't see that as a positive sign uh, for Congressman Doggett. I'm not his lawyer. I'm not part of his legal team. They may have a different view, but I do believe that that is you know, asking them to justify perhaps an idea they have. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think that and, and, you know, the task force is not the only party that's going to brief it. I think anybody can brief it, but I believe the inquiry was specifically asked of them because they have advanced the position that, that there, there aren't issues concerning racially polarized voting in CD25. Uh, and that uh, that by drawing this district into San Antonio and Central Texas, you can now truly have a minority opportunity for the minority community to have an out, you know, a say in the right. outcome of electing members to Congress. And that really has been one of the most contentious issues oh, in the congressional been. map. I it mean, it, it caused a lot of discomfort in the original map when it looked as if your uh, your colleague, Representative Castro, was going to be running sure. against Lloyd Doggett. It, you know, how do you sort that out when you're on the ground in the middle? That you talked about. I'm sure it's not as bad as running against your third grade friend, but <laughs> it's probably pretty close at some well, level. You know, I, I think that you know, people make decisions to run for office, and I think in in, in the case of, of Joaquin Castro, I think he felt that, that it was his time to to you know move on, and he saw this as an opportunity to run for Congress, and and. Uh, you know, and at the time, I, I think that, you know, you have to really, you know, look at Joaquin and, and, and give him a pat on the back for having the courage to step into a ring uh, and be, you know, uh, under, you know, overwhelmed by the amount of, of, uh, of seniority and, and financial advantage that someone like Lloyd Doggett has. Uh, but I think Castro realized very quickly that he was formidable. I think the people in the fundraising community recognized that this would be an opportunity to elect a Hispanic. And, and, and people from all parts of that district came together and, you know, he blinked his eyes and he was sitting at half a million dollars. Uh, you know, now with a court opinion that was just recently released with, a, with an interim map, I think if you are running for Congress in Congressional District 25, you do not have a lot of time. Uh, you have to make a decision by this Friday and you have a primary uh, on May 29th. Uh, I think that, that uh, in my view, I think folks that are seriously looking at this or perhaps maybe looking at this for another race down the road. I think that this is not something that you want to rush into. You should never make, you know, rush into anything. You don't want to have that kind of remorse. I think people that are very, you know, methodical and in their approach are, are going to see. But, but, the, but the, the demography is the demography. And election statistics, you know, speak for themselves. And they, they, there appears to be a strong preference for uh, a Latino uh, running in CD35 as it exists. Now, if it changes, of course, now we, Malk has taken the position that you could you know, take Austin out of the out of the, the mix, and Austin can you know, and, and whether legislative leaders want to protect Austin or not, that's another fight for another day. But don't carve in this minority opportunity. Don't anchor Austin and, and make it part of the issue. We can certainly go from the same, take the same district as it stands today, and once you get up to about San Marcos, you hang a right turn and go towards Bastrop, right, and 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 be independent of Travis County. Uh, the court has already demonstrated that that can happen. And I suspect that if the, if, the, if the D.C. court provides protection for CD25 as a coalition district, then that's, in fact, what will happen in the remedy. They will have to remove Austin from CD35. Uh, there's pockets of San Antonio that can be acquired to make up for the population loss. And moving the district into Bastrop uh, will certainly make it a minority opportunity district and probably give anyone from San Antonio a strong advantage uh, if, if they were to choose to run for that race. And right now we're just reading the tea leaves on that, essentially. I think so. I, I think Sylvia Romo, I understand, is, is running in San Antonio. Uh, I, I saw a lot of her signs on my drive up to Austin this morning. And, and I know that uh, Congressman Doggett yesterday uh, called me uh, on a cell phone that has a San Antonio area code. So it sounds like to me he's, you know, he's, he's in it for the long haul. But, but I think that, that there are many people that want to see the litigation finalized before they decide you know, on what they want to do. And, and, you know, I wouldn't fault them for, for being cautious like that. Um, 
I, I want to talk a little bit about the politics of this, but I want to ask one last kind of general question about this. I mean, what we've been talking about is, you know, kind of the, le the, the legislative process of drawing the maps being, you know, kind of washed out through the legal process. No, you know, nobody gets everything they want, clearly. In the end, how do you think that worked? Well, I, I think that if, if I compare today's map to what was passed off the floor of the House, I mean, it's a night and day difference. I mean, there are six districts that didn't exist before. Um, the, the discovery in this case uh, really showed a very ugly side of redistricting. I mean, there were emails that were produced, uh, and, and the case was very, very clear. I mean, the object of the game was to draw a district that had the illusion of minority dominance, but these map drawers knew very specifically you know, the areas of, of town where people didn't vote. And so while on the, uh, at the 30,000 foot view, you had a district that, that had a, a perception of a Hispanic majority, but election performance indicated that these folks weren't active. And that's okay, I mean, this, you can't force people to vote. I mean, that, that's, but while they were doing that, they knew exactly where those communities were that were politically engaged and politically cohesive, and they were taking them out and dispersing them in other places. Uh, you know, that's not what redistricting ought to be about. I mean, I think whoever's in charge, obviously that's the way it's always been. You know, you, you preserve your political power. I have no problem with that. The minute you do it on the backs of minority community, then I have a big problem with that. Uh, and, and we've demonstrated what we're willing to do. And, you know, frankly, uh, even if it meant moving the Texas primary a couple of times, that's how important of an issue it was and still is for Malk. Uh, and, and I think that, that on another level, I think it's really excited some people. I think people are looking for, you know, for, for minorities and Latinos to actually start taking bigger positions and taking stands uh, in a very visible way because I think it serves as a basis of inspiration for people to understand that if they get a little bit more engaged, you know, that they're going to be supporting people that are willing to have these kinds of fights and make, you know, you know make tremendous gains uh, for the community. I mean, that with, with, with one lawsuit, we've improved this map with six Hispanic districts in, in Texas. Uh, and we believe that, that this court in D.C. could possibly make that even a little bit better. Uh, and that would have never happened uh, had we sat this one out on the sidelines. I think there were some great advocates involved and would have done a good job. But I think it takes a certain perspective of somebody, you know, of a caucus that, that knows both sides of the process. We know our way around the courtroom as lawyers, but we also know our way around the policy room and how things get done and what happens behind the scenes. And if there's going to be a bone buried somewhere, where is it buried? Uh, I think that our, our caucus really uh, was able to uncover, you know, lots of things that otherwise might have been glossed over or overlooked because it, it was insignificant to the outside world. The process seems to inevitably generate tensions even among coalition partners. And there was, you know, some coverage of that publicly and, you know, some degree of talk about the negotiations with the attorney general, who was in, who was oh, out yeah. at, at various stages, you know, the outcome. I mean, and I, and I think that... Uh, to some degree, that seems unavoidable. Is that, how durable is that? I mean, how, A, how accurate was that? Maybe that wasn't very accurate, but it does seem that there was some tension among different Latino organizations at different points, perhaps some tension among African-American and Latino organizations. Well, I, you know, I, I, because this is an educational program, I mean, I think it's important to get into. I, I know there are people who would love to write about this. I mean, so I'll, I'll be very, very careful. Uh, I mean, the issue is very real. I think that, that from a demographic perspective, uh, you see minorities growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, frankly, from a socioeconomic perspective, they all tend to reside in certain areas, certain concentrations of major cities. Uh, and when you have this you know, cohesion among minority groups you know, to stand together and, and support each other's candidates in the general elections, I think primaries become you know, very, very, uh, very, very competitive. Uh, and, and so, you, you know, we saw, you know, instances where, where people in certain parts of the state would say, hey, you know, we're, we're concerned about there being too many Hispanics in this part of the state because that's a threat to our existing, you know, status quo. And, uh, but, you know, again, I mean, you know, this is something that you can't, you know, you, you cannot fix. I mean, this is, this, this is the reality of, of, a, of a state that's changing by the day, particularly with, with respect to Latino growth. Now, on the outside about, you know, people being critical of others who negotiated with the attorney general or, or uh, you know, trying to cut deals, uh, it was pretty clear, at least from my viewpoint, that if a minority group that wasn't sort of considered to be a team player, if you will, on other issues, uh, if, if they engaged in negotiation with the attorney general, that was, you know, that was, a, you know, that was a personal foul. You couldn't do that. That was, uh, you know, cutting a deal with the enemy. But if, you know, other minority groups, uh, 
uh, were doing it, it was sort of almost, you know, it was almost not necessarily, I won't say blessed, but it was, you know, it was encouraged. It was, uh, it was okay. And, and so uh, I'm, I'm very, uh, I like to, to take up for groups like Maldef, uh, you know, because they seem to catch a lot of uh, criticism for, for presenting the plan with the Attorney General. And, and what I learned in one year of redistricting, uh, in one year I learned 40 years of redistricting history. Uh, and, and I was told about time after time that you know certain party leaders in both parties decided the outcome, and it didn't matter what the minority community thought. Uh, the only difference today is that those making those decisions happen to be minorities, and they're making decisions that's in the best interest of their constituency. And there were certain people that didn't like that. Weren't, they're not used to being in that role. They're used to calling the shots, not you know being on the receiving end. And so I, 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 you know, had a very candid conversation with Nancy Pelosi when she was in San Antonio. And she asked me that question. And a member of Congress who was in the room criticized Maldef. And I said, nobody in this room should say one thing negative about Maldef. Because decisions were being made on their backs decade after decade, and nobody cared. You know, now Maldef's in a position to actually have an impact. Uh, and, and, you know, all of a sudden that's cause for concern. Well, that's, you know, that's, you reap what you sow. I mean, and... And frankly, um, you know, I think they did a, they, they made a good call. Uh, I think that you can, you know, take, you know, political, you know, sides and, but Mal Maldiv doesn't play the politics. Malk doesn't play the politics. I mean, we drew a district, uh, Malk drew a district in West Texas that would probably, I think, uh, I think Barack Obama, President Obama received 30% of the vote in the district we drew uh, in West Texas. We knew it was going to elect a Hispanic Republican. We were fine with that. We were fine with that. Uh, you know, the, the, the most important thing is that it could be done. I mean, no one ever, I mean, I don't know if you'd ever think that in Odessa and Midland and places like that, you can elect a Hispanic. Um, you now can. Unfortunately, that didn't happen in this round, but, you know, you, you don't have to wait 10 years to bring a Section 2 claim. You can bring a Section 2 claim at any time. So who knows? We may revisit that down the road. Uh, but but uh, I think that, that more of these, uh, these, these uh, staged events between minority groups oftentimes had political motive, uh, and they weren't done purely on race issues uh, and ethnicity issues. I think that, you know, minority communities saw this as an opportunity for minorities. Sometimes politics gets in the way of that. Yeah, I mean, I mean so, so it sounds to me like you think that the real takeaway is that things are complex when you're actually at the table and everybody's a full player. Everyone's a full player, and I think that, you know, again, this is a sign that this is a state. I, I think redistricting from going forward will be done much differently now, and I think that that minorities have now recognized that they will have a growing role at the decision-making table. You know, so when there's talks about revamping the system and going to these commissions, you have minorities going, hey, hey, wait a minute, you know, since 1970, we've been on the receiving end of deals being cut and us being, you know, being left out. Now we're in a position to have an impact and right those wrongs for the last 30, 40 years. Don't take it away from us. So now you're talking about a point of commission all of a sudden. Well, I, you know, it seems to be pretty popular <laughs> yeah. now. Uh, you know, Senator Wentworth's idea seems to have, have, have gained some momentum, uh, at least in the Senate. I mean, I think the House is still a little mixed. Well, I was going to ask you about that because we've done some polling on that, you know, periodically in the sure. UT Tribune poll. And you don't, I mean, what you find is there's, it's the, the results are surprisingly steady. So you've got about 40% or so in favor. But you've also got about 30, 35 percent that don't really know what you're talking about. So it's very unformed. So do you have any kind of feel for that? You know, I think that, that redistricting and reapportionment is very much inside baseball. Uh, I think that I have never seen in my, you know, 12 years in the, in the State House, I've never seen a truly independent commission. I mean, if the commission gets appointed by somebody, it's not independent, you know. And uh, I, I, you look in California where they have a commission uh, the National Association of Latino Elected Officials, NALEO, you know, was very critical of the map that was presented by the commission in California, said that you know, minorities were left behind. You look in Arizona, I mean, Governor Brewer called a special session to throw out the head of the redistricting commission because uh, she thought he, he or she wasn't being fair and was maybe being too democratic. Uh, you know, you're always going to have some control when, when there's someone else doing the appointing. And, and frankly, you know, if, if there's going to be somebody, you know, brawling it out when it comes to redistricting, it ought to be the electeds uh, that sign up for the job and not try to, you know, mask it and pass it off as a independent work by independent commissioners. Yeah, it seems like, you know, there, there might even be an argument that the visibility of the fights is actually giving you a little more of the transparency and a little more attention to it that you might want. I mean, as long as there's, I mean, as long as there's an interest in the outcome, it, it's, it's going to be very difficult to achieve it pure independence uh, at a commission level. 
All right, so lurk, lurking below these politics, or not even lurking, but kind of really the structure of this discussion, it really is demographics underneath. That's really what's driving a lot of this. So let's talk a little bit about that to, to kind of wind things down. I mean, how do you think about the resurgence in the, or the, 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 the increase in the Latino population on one hand and democratic prospects on the other? Is this, does this automatically lead to a democratic resurgence? You know, uh, <clears throat> this, is, this comes from Nina Perales, and she was the lead lawyer for the task force. She's a, you know, the vice president of litigation for MALDEF. I mean, she made a pretty compelling argument that, you know, Republicans have, you know, every right and opportunity to attract Latinos into their party. Uh, you know, and, and I think there's really two options. I mean, you can embrace and recruit and make Latinos a priority in your party, or you can, you know, vilify them, set them up, uh, and, and make a choice to, you know, not make them a priority. And, and then, you know, and Nina's, you know, articulated to me, looking at public policy choices, looking at map making, uh, you know, exercises that, that the Republican Party, at least for now, has chosen that aspect. Now, there may be, you know, I can't speak for the Republican Party, I'm not a Republican, uh, but I also know that there are people in the Republican Party that are working very hard to, to, to bring more Latinos into the fold. But, you know, the, the recipe for success as a Latino elected official really hasn't been in the Republican Party, even in a state like Texas. Having said that, I think that, that Texas Democrats uh, should also heed and not take for granted that, you know, Latinos are going to be there for them all the time. I think we've seen this in race after race. Uh, where, you know, the, the enthusiasm with Latino voters for statewide candidates hasn't really been that great. And, you know, I like to say that, that as a Democrat, I think Democrats have the right message, uh, but sometimes we have the wrong messenger. Uh, and I think that that's very important. And so what I like to, to look at, it, at least when I look at the members of MAUC, you know, I see, you know, just a farm team of, you know, up and coming Latino and Latina leaders that are getting elected in their 20s. Uh, they all have professional degrees. Uh, they all are successful in, in what they do outside the legislature. Uh, and frankly, they have a longer staying power in, in, in the Texas House, or at least in politics. They seem to survive, you know, election after election. Uh, and so I think that, that, you know, if I'm, you know, if I'm calling the shots for the Democratic Party, I'm looking at that diversity and finding ways to embrace that diversity. And, and, uh, and when that happens, I think that, that there's gonna be a combination of things that need to occur, I mean, at, at the national level and at the state level, but once there's a decision you know, made to actually concentrate uh, on getting a minority or a Latino elected statewide uh, in Texas and make a sincere effort to do so, I, I think that we might see you know, some changes. And, and so it doesn't just take the, it's not just the natural growth of Latino population, it's the ability to, you know, to, to take that package and actually present that on the statewide stage uh, and, and, you know, and like I said, I mean, you, you can look at the membership page of MAUC and you can see several men and women that have that potential that are, I mean, again, very, very young and will be in politics for the next 10, 20, 30 years if the voters will have them. Uh, and, and I think that the next crop of rising stars for the Democratic Party, I mean this respectfully to all my Democratic colleagues, I think are, are, are going be, uh, to be minorities, uh, either African-American or Hispanic. Um. There's no way to not ask you about Jay and Lozano in the context of that conversation. <laughs> I apologize no, it's somewhat, okay. but no, no. Um, I mean that it, that's also part of the short-term strategy is to recruit seated members and to try to and to try to flip people to the other party. I, I will say, um, you know, JM is is, a, is really a nice guy. I mean, if you're around JM, you know, it'll take five minutes for him to make you laugh. I mean, he's got a great personality. Uh, you know, I think politics, you know, there's a certain greenness to politics when you first get in it. And, and I have no idea why he made that decision. Yes, the, the, the district that was drawn for him is not a, a stellar district. Uh, but you're looking at Democrats that run down the ballot that are getting four, 53 and 54 percent of the vote. I mean, that's a, in my view, that's a pretty safe Democratic district. Uh, um, you know, he made the decision to switch parties. I think that the lifespan uh, for Hispanic Democrats that become Hispanic Republicans isn't, the shelf life isn't very long, uh, number one. And number two, I think for Hispanic, at least state lawmakers that I've served with, uh, you know, many of them have found challenges in terms of coming back. I mean, Raul Torres was paired and eliminated in the state house map. Uh, Dee Margo now faces a very uphill climb. 
uh, in El Paso uh, with a Hispanic district. And, and, and what's funny about this is that it seems to me that the Hispanic Republicans do better in districts that have lower percentages of Hispanics. Uh, and I remember uh, 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 Jose Aliceda from Beeville was asked on the stand, uh, sir, you recognize you were not the choice of the minority community. And um, he said, how do you know that? <laughs> and they said, well, it's called statistics. I mean, you know, uh, and did you know you received 20% of the vote of the Hispanic community? Uh, and he didn't know that. I did not know that. Uh, I think that, that uh, you know, there's still some challenges uh, about being brown and being a Republican. JM, I, I assume, made the decision that he thinks is best for JM. Election data, you know, paints another picture, but, you know, we'll know in November. And, and so I think it'll be a very uh, robust election. I think the people in Jim Wells and Claiborne County, you know, have a lot to say about elections in South Texas. And, and, uh, and, and we'll know soon enough. Whether it was a good idea. Perhaps. And, and, you know, and I think, you know, it is what it is. And, and I, I wish him well. And if he's back in January, he'll be a member of MAUC. And we look forward to working with him. And, you know, and if he's not, then, you know, it's, it's just, you know, one of those things. I, I think that there's, sounds to me like there's a, there are a couple of Hispanics that are looking to run in that district. And there may be an announcement, you know, in the next couple of days. And so needless to say, I think it's going to be a hard fight for either, either candidate. You talked about all these um, young, promising Latinos in the caucus. Uh, you know, you're not exactly, you know, long in the tooth. Uh, <laughs> I feel it, though. <laughs> my body, my bones are old, though. I... Uh, you know, somebody, you know, as, as I was talking to somebody earlier, they said you've got to ask him why, you know, why he didn't run for one of the congressional seats. Well, you know, I put it to you this way. Um, filing deadline's not till Friday. And so, you know... You know, keep John Reynolds, you know, <laughs> scratching his head over there. But, uh, uh, you know, if I have a bad day in a city like Austin, you know, it's hard to have a bad day in Austin. It's a beautiful city, great people. But when I do have a bad day, uh, let me tell you how old I am. I'm old enough to where I used to play CDs in my car. And so, you know, I put a CD in my car, and by the time I get to track 15, I'm pulling into my driveway in San Antonio. And there's something to be said about that. I mean, being close to home, I have a 3-year-old and a 19-month-old, and I have a wife that's very difficult to not be around, you know. So uh, that's what's important to me right now. Uh, public service is great, whether it's here in Washington or somewhere else. And I'll know when that time comes. Uh, this, this, this whole issue of redistricting and creating districts, you know, it, it was never and should never be about one person. I mean, it should be about creating these opportunities. And, and as long as I feel like I'm productive where I'm at, you know, I'm, I'm not itching to be anywhere, anywhere you know, anytime soon. Uh, but, you know, as you know, in politics, most of it is timing and, and, uh, and, you know, and when that time comes, you know, whether it be by Friday or two years from now or five years from now, uh, we have some big challenges here in the state of Texas. I, I will tell you this and, and you'll be the first to know it. Uh, uh, it'll be a matter of time before Malk intervenes formally in the voter ID lawsuit in Washington, D.C. Uh, we know our way around that place. I think we've built quite a reputation with that court in Washington and one of the judges in our DC litigation is also a judge in the voter ID litigation. And we think that uh, we'll have a big impact there. And, and I've authorized our Mount Council to start having conversations uh, in, insofar as it relates to public school finance. Uh, I, I, I have been enlightened by the opportunities that we have uh, for what we can, you know, for what, whether you do it as a minority or you do it as a Democrat, you know, what you are denied on the floor of the House, you know, everybody's equal in a courtroom. Uh, and all you need is good lawyers and an opportunity to fight. Uh, and so whether we're fighting on redistricting or voter ID or school finance, uh, you know, I still have a little fight left in me, although I'm tired. Uh, I have a little fight left in me and I want to see these projects, uh, you know, follow through. Uh, and, you know, that's going to keep me occupied. And, and I think it's more important for me to be involved in those fights and, and those policy decisions. And we'll worry about politics for another day. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? from the audience. If you work for me, you can't ask a question. <laughs> you got a microphone coming to you. Okay, I'll ask one. Uh, as far as redistricting is concerned, um, it seems to me that the, the redistricting systems that we have currently have no independence. And so the question really is, isn't some independence 
better than no independence. So you mentioned you know, California, for example. California's new system is a system based on a citizen's commission rather than Jeff Wentworth's, which is a politician's commission. Um, it seems to me that they're all quite different. Uh, and, and it seems to me that the California system is moving in, in a better direction than we are currently. And so I'd like you to comment. Well, you know, I, I think that, that, you know, always the, the, the proof is in the pudding. I think that, you know, I have not yet seen a proposal or have had explained to me a proposal that would really guarantee you know, a modicum of independence. I mean, you're always going to have winners and losers in a, in a, in a game like redistricting. Uh, but, but I think that, um, you know, what's being proposed in Texas doesn't seem to get us uh, but one step removed from the elected officials. And, and frankly, uh, it doesn't seem like a good idea. Uh, I'm not familiar with the California model. Uh, I don't know how the citizens are appointed. I don't know if they run. Uh, you know, in Texas, you can draw a line from El Paso to Corpus, and everything south of that line has you know, is, is one Texas and everything north of that line is another Texas. I, I'd like to see how these citizen districts, you know, evolve. I mean, even in a state like, please, <laughs> even in a state like Texas, I'll be real honest with you, the beginning of our lawsuit uh, in redistricting included a, a paragraph that we were fighting uh, for single member districts in the Railroad Commission. Uh, and, uh, and frankly, it concerned lots of people uh, because I think you can start a district from the tip of Brownsville and move up to San Antonio and hang a right turn and go to El Paso. And every day of the week, a Hispanic will get elected uh, to the Railroad Commission. Uh, and, and so, I mean, I think that there are ways to be creative about doing things better. Uh, and redistricting is certainly an area that could, could, could use a lot of improvement. Uh, but, but as I said, I mean, absent your idea, I've, I've yet to see something in the floor of the House that would suggest that there's going to be some semblance of independence. Yes. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Other questions? The, you mentioned the potential for uh, change in C-25 based on the D.C. courts uh, ruling or regarding retrogression. Do you see anything, uh, any other possibilities, particularly with the House, state house map, uh, <clears throat> like Nueces County? Well, I, I think that, that uh, the way Nueces County has been explained to me by our legal counsel is it, it appears the elimination of a district in corpus was an offset for a gain made somewhere else, which is entirely permissible in Section 5. Uh, I think that the, the question remains, uh, if there are other districts, I think arguably some would say that perhaps the district that J.M. Lozano represented perhaps could have been, you know, maybe may have retrogressed somewhat. I'm not sure. Uh, but I do know this, all it takes is, you know, for instance, uh, there's an argument to be made about changes in Houston. And there is a district in the 137, which is represented now by Scott Hogberg, that there seem to have been some adjustments to that district when they created the new district. Uh, and if that requires a change, then even a few percentage points really changes a lot of Harris County. Uh, there's been issues about intentional race uh, line drawing in Dallas, in parts of North Dallas. And we know that that was the basis for the creation of the congressional district in CD33, the new congressional district. Uh, but that same creativity with the map drawing existed in the state house map. Uh, lots of evidence about that. Lots of pictures of lines coming in to pick up minority population and then dispersing them to faraway places. Uh, I think that that issue is, is, is potentially on the table. and and. Some would take even that further, more, how should I say, uh, more optimistic view that some believe that the map could be so bad and the manner and means by which Texas adopted its map could just be so just riddled with discrimination that some would argue that they would question the viability of the entire map because of the motive. I'm not so sure if that's a winning theory or not, but, but there are people who are smarter than me that spend more years in voter for rights litigation that seem to think that that's a possibility and certainly defer to that view. But, but uh, I think I'll be you know, just as optimistic and I'll anticipate what comes out of Washington. I think it was a very interesting trial and, and you know, as you mentioned, redistricting is not pretty. You should see a lot of the emails that were produced and lots of the, you know, wasn't me, it was him kind of thing. You know, uh, uh, it was, a, you know, it certainly is an exercise in, in political 
you know, operatives at their best. Yeah, sure. Can you please identify yourself? <laughs> she's looking like she, was, she, like she was asking if it was OK. Yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah. I didn't know if it was all right. I just wanted to ask if you all have made a decision on appealing the last order. You sound like you think the May 29th is a go. I, I think that um, I think it's, it's interesting to know the mechanics of a stay procedure. And I think the, the immediate application for a stay uh, will first be received and reviewed by Justice Scalia. Uh, I think that, that you know, for some people that might be you know, somewhat of a deterrent. Uh, I think that the map is, a, is, a, uh, you know, is an example or embodiment of what the Supreme Court said. You know, draw, you know, draw a map uh, that defers to the legislature and identify areas that have voting rights issues and fix those areas. Uh, doesn't mean that that's going to be the final map. And, and, and we all know in litigation you have the temporary relief, then you have the permanent relief. Uh, there's some people who feel that our, our, uh, it would be better to preserve our arguments for the ultimate map and not the map that's going to go before uh, the 2012 voters. Uh, and, and so at least for Malk, we've not made any public decisions, uh, but our internal discussions are to, to really weigh uh, the significance of filing a stay now or reserving and preserving our theories for the ultimate adoption of a final map. Do you think this is going to come up again in the next legislature? You know, I hope so. I, you, know, I, 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 you know, I'm hanging out with, with, I'm in the Capitol, and I run into some of my friends, and, and, uh, and they'll tell me, well, you know, you, you know what you did. Uh, you know, we're just going to come back next session and redraw them. I'm like, yeah, well, you know that that's got to be pretty clear too, right? I mean, you know, and so, so, I mean, you know, it's not a matter of how bad you want to draw this map. It's, you know, can you do it right? Uh, I think the, the legislature demonstrated that they really messed this up, uh, and the trail of evidence isn't pretty. Uh, and, and so suffice it to say that if this were to change again, the state of Texas will have to ask itself one more time, do we bypass the DOJ or do we go directly uh, to the D.C. court? I think, I think the D.C. courts have, have had enough <laughs> of Texas political people that they don't want anything to do with us anymore. And, and, and while I think that there'll be people hell bent on, on you know, waging this war again in 2013, I think people need to look at the state of our public education system, the state of our public health system, and you know, recognize that there's only so many times we can raise tuition on college students you know, to, to balance a budget. Um, and I think we should work on those real problems. And, and you know, I think the voters and the taxpayers have had enough politics. That, you know, I think that's probably why we do this every 10 years. It takes <laughs> 10 years to get over it. You know? And just when you get over it, you have to do it all over again. So. It's kind of ironic. I mean, you mentioned the, the D.C. court. It's ironic that going into this, everybody felt like the DOJ was going to be the backstop the first time you had a Democratic administration, at least in terms of the, from the Democratic perspective, and that the court system turned, has turned out to be just as much of a problem for, you know, for, for that ambition, for overreach, as, as the DOJ would have been. I think that, that the, the men and women that serve on the district court for the District of Columbia are really at, at the you know they the epitome of you know their judicial game. I mean, uh, these are great judges with great backgrounds. They don't have to play politics. They don't have to run for office. And they'll be there when you know when the Republicans control Congress. They'll be there when the Democrats control Congress. I think they're there to do a job. Uh, and they called it straight. You didn't see a lot of you know split decisions or or you know one judge you know disagreeing with another judge publicly. They are very professional very methodical, uh, ask good questions. And, and I think that you know, they recognize that whatever took place in the state of Texas wasn't proper. Uh, I think the ultimate, you know, the, the ultimate uh, uh, proof of that will be in their opinion or their order. Uh, but every step of the way, they've challenged. I mean, they, they, there was a motion for summary judgment. And that's pretty easy stuff. That's Civil Procedure 101. And you say the other side doesn't have a claim, you know, they, as a matter of law, they don't have a claim, so you should just decide as a matter of law. And that's what Texas did. And they said, you know, we win as a matter of law. There's nothing here that says that we did anything that violates Section 5, so just, you know, sign this order so we can move on. And the court usually says yes or no. And it's a pretty simple answer. It's yes or no. But this court went a little further. In a four-page opinion, they said, you know, moreover, we question the standards and methodologies used by the state of Texas in arriving at the conclusion that they did not uh, retrogress. That was a pretty big hint, like there's a problem here, Houston. Uh, and, uh, and like I said, I think that the trial is proof positive of that. And, and 
and we will know, you know, in a matter of days or weeks, uh, you know, what they really think of us, and and um, and that may require a change of the map once again. It's something. It is. It is something. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it.